It's good that uh, you're here and uh, you're now in that kind of mood. And if you have your cell phones with you, put them on vibrate or turn them off right now. Because that's what I had to be doing. And I forgot this morning. But uh, if you, just in case you, you've forgotten or, or missed doing that this morning, go ahead and do that now. We're going to be looking at a passage that talks about um, three young men. And I'm guessing they're probably three young guys that are in their own 20s. And uh, maybe you're familiar with them or not, but um, when I was younger, we called them Meshach, Shadrach, and Tabednego. It's actually and Abed and Abednego. And now I can't even say no, Abednego. But we used to say Shadrach, Meshach, and Tabednego. But uh, in Daniel's uh, book, uh, book of, uh, in the Old Testament, in the third chapter, that's where we're going to be finding our story this morning. And it's in the verse eight through thirty this morning long section of scripture, and we're going to try to work our way through it quickly. Um, but uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were three young Jewish men that uh, were in a foreign country that were challenged, and uh, I think you'll find their, their story kind of interesting this morning. I got to begin, though, by asking a couple questions, a few questions. What are you willing to do in the face of conflict? And, uh, of course, these are rhetorical questions you don't have to answer. But what are you willing to do in the face of conflict? For what causes would you be willing to die? You thought about that. Is there any cause that you'd be willing to die for? Would you be willing to go against the authorities of our, of our country to follow God? Would you be willing to die for your faith? Do you realize that today across the world there's people that are still being martyred for the faith of Jesus? Lots of times we don't realize that because we're in Canada, we don't face this kind of challenge very often, if ever. But the reality is there's people around the world that are dying because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Would you be willing to face immeasurable pain for your God? How far would you go to proclaim that your God is the only true God? You know, this is today we're going to see these, these three young men in their battle. It's a very similar battle that answers all these questions and how they would have, how they handled it. And you know, the reality is, there's going to be a day that in the future, I believe, that we're going to have to face much of these things too. Because if you look at uh, around us in the in uh, so our Canadian society, I was talking to a few people about this this week. You notice that it's okay. We as a prayer meeting this week, we're talking about this actually. Now that I remember where we were. That it's okay to bash Christianity today, but not any other religion. You notice that ever? It's okay to say something negative about Christianity. It's okay for a band, a, uh, a secular band, to have a, a symbol for their band that's a cross with a, that basically a, like, do not enter uh, thing through or slash through. Remember, have you ever seen that again? Or I think it's called bad religion. It's okay to do that today in North America. So I believe as, as things go, as our society develops, as our society regresses in some ways, it's going to be harder and harder for us to proclaim our faith in Jesus Christ. And the challenge is going to be to see if how far or how willing you are to face or to, or to stand up to those challenges. We need to be willing to stand up for what we believe. Standing up for what you believe is going to be so primary in our workplaces, in our schools, and so forth. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not necessarily one of those far-right, fundamentalist type persons, although I consider myself very conservative in my faith. I'm not talking about whether or not there's prayer in school, or I'm not talking about whether or not there's prayer in the parliament, and things like that, because those things have been dealt with in our country already. I remember when I was in grade 6, we stood up and we sang all Canada in, in school and we did the Lord's Prayer. And that's in public school, that's not Catholic school. Um, we don't do that anymore. But I'm not talking about those challenges necessarily. I'm talking about real challenges to our faith. So before we begin, before we look at this passage, let's begin with the word of prayer this morning. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this opportunity we have to come and to worship in your house this morning. Lord, we pray that, you, that we do not take it for granted, but we realize that in this day and age, we have this freedom in our country. But Lord, the day may come when we have to face this, these challenges, that our doors may be closed and things like that, and we might have to look and see how we might be able to, to worship you. But Father, I pray that we would reflect on the young men like we are going to look at today, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And Lord, I pray that we would take these these witnesses, these testimonies, seriously, and, and 
see how we might stand up in these kind of battles, in these kind of stresses. Father, I pray now that you just guide our time this morning as we look into your word, as we continue to worship, as we study, uh, take a moment to study your word, to, to reflect on, on what you have for us to hear this morning. And I pray for these things now in your son's precious name, Jesus Christ. Amen. So beginning in this passage, we're looking, trying to get through all 30 verses, or not 30 verses, but 8 through 30, and uh, we'll try to walk through quickly, because I believe these, it helps us understand a lot of what we're, we're dealing with. Now, if you go up in the early part of chapter 3 and previously, we see that the king, who is Nebuchadnezzar, has put, on, put together, uh, built a, a, had a statue built that is 90 feet tall, tall, pardon, 90 feet tall and 90 feet wide. So not a little, it's not a little thing. It's a golden statue. That's back up in verse 1 of this chapter. And he's declared that whenever the, the musicians stand to play, whenever the music starts, that everyone in the area is to bow down to this golden image and to worship it. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Christian, not Christian, well, we could call them Christian, I guess, in a sense, but they're believers in, in, in God. They're Jewish men. And this is what we this is what we find ourselves in chapter in verse eight of chapter three. So some Chaldeans took this occasion to come forward with and maliciously accuse the Jews. They said to the king Nebuchadnezzar, "May the king live forever." So they're trying to pump him up and trying to make him feel good, you know. In lots of the, these ancient religion, or ancient societies, the kings were looked at and, or the rulers were looked at as gods. It says you as king have issued a decree. That everyone who hears the sounds of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the drum, and every kind of music must fall down and worship the golden statue. Whoever does not fall down and worship it will be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. There are some Jews you have appointed to manage the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men have ignored you, king, you the king. They do not serve your God or worship the golden statue you have set up. In this section of scripture, I've just called it standing for what is right. You know, they were, when they heard these, this decree, they, when they heard this, they knew that they believed that they couldn't follow it. And I'm under of the belief that, you know, that we are to follow the laws of the land. I, I believe that uh, even scripturally we were told to follow the laws of the land, but only to a point. If the laws of the land tell us that we're not to worship our God, are supposed to worship another thing, that's where we have to draw the line. In our country, we haven't had that experience yet. But there are countries in this, in this world that have those experiences. When you, if you, uh, we have a friend of ours that, is, that are missionaries in Malaysia, and the state government there is Muslim. And for those who are in that country, the, that are Christian, it's not so much that you have to convert to be a Muslim, but if a Muslim converts to be a Christian, he faces many dangers. So for instance, if, he's a, if it's a family, the children will be taken away and raised by a different family. So there's, there is places in this world that have those kind of things, yet in that country there are still men and women who come to the understanding that God is who He is, that he is the one true God, and they do stand up for what they what is right, and they believe in him, and they worship him, even with the danger of what might happen to them. So these young men in our story here, in our in this testimony, understand that a decree has been made, because if you look at up in verse 12, it tells us that they've been appointed to manage the province of Babylon. So these Jewish men are not just the average they're not like slaves or anything like that. They're actually rulers. They actually have authority in, in the country. So they know the decrees. They know the laws of the land. Yet, because they believe in God and they know who their God is, they're willing to stand up for Him. Stand up for what is right. These men have, uh, uh, it says, have ignored you, the king, and they do not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. So these men, these, these young, three young men, would not turn from what is right. Now we go on and we continue to look at the, onto this passage in verse 13 through 15, and we see what happens when we stand in the, stand in the face of the wrong. It says in verse 13, then, the, then in a furious rage, Nebuchadnezzar gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So these men were brought before him, the king, before the king. Nebuchadnezzar asked them, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you do not serve my God or worship the golden statue I've set up? He's, he's curious. Like I said, he's, he's giving them the benefit of the doubt. Surely these guys aren't telling the truth. Surely that you're not going to go against what I've commanded, what I've ordered, and especially as uh, in a place of authority, you're not going to to to, uh, to stand against what I've commanded. Now, in verse 15, it says, If you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the drum, and every kind of music, uh, fall down and worship the statue I have made. But if you do not worship it, you will be immediately, you will immediately be thrown into a furnace of blazing fire. And who is the God who can rescue you from my power? Now, They've been challenged, haven't they? You and I are going to come into situations where we're told you can't profess your, your beliefs, you can't do such and such, you can't tell people what you believe, you can't do any of those kinds of things because this is what I command you to do. Now what do we do in, those, in, the, in the face of those battles? Well, we know when we look at in, further into the New, the New Testament, Paul, what did he do in those, in those situations? He stood up and he preached. He faced all kinds of, of horrors, such as, as being stoned, as being beaten, and all, all kinds of difficulties. We look at Peter and John in, uh, they, in the fourth chapter of Acts. What happened with them? They're told by the authorities that you don't preach the name of Jesus Christ anymore. And what did they do? Well, they went, went back to the, their fellowship, and they prayed, and they stood, and they preached. Because they knew what was right. They, they were standing in the face of what was wrong. They stood against what the world would say that they were to do. They stood against even what the religious world said they should be only, only be doing. You and I must be willing to stand up for what is right and, and face what is wrong. We can't be, be, uh, be those who just seriously fall back and don't, and don't follow. See, because uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego could have said, okay, King, you're in charge. I'll do what you tell me. Now, I face this challenge in lots of ways, too, when I work with the military. As a chaplain, we're told that we can't proselytize. So, in other words, we can't make believe in other people. We can't preach, our, preach what, we're, what we believe. And I turned around and I said, well, I can't do that. Now, I, and I told the other chaplains, I said, if you guys have to fire me, fire me, but this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to proclaim who Jesus is. So what I I worked my way around it a little bit and played with the rules a little bit, but um, basically I found a way in order to be able to proclaim who Jesus was to those who came in to see. Because what I would do is when they came in and said, I'm struggling, I don't know, what to, I know my marriage is falling apart, but I just basically say to them, well, can I tell you what I think would really help your marriage? And they would say yes. I said, well, I know that if you just turn your life over to Christ, then you'd, you'd experience a real change in your marriage. Now, I'm not telling you that to say that look how good I am, because there's other times that I'm very, um, that I'm, I'm, I've been, uh, had a, been afraid also. But we need to be willing to stand up for what is right, even in the face of, especially in the face of what is wrong. And these young men, we see, we'll see now what they, how they reply. Verse 16 through 18. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer to this question. If the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace and the blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you to know, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. Interesting testimony they give given here, isn't it? So they basically told the king, we will, we're not going to do what you've commanded us to do. We're not going to stand up and worship your gods. We're not going to bow down to your statue that you created, these things created by your hands. We're not going to follow what you asked us to follow. We're going to follow who? The one true God. And their testimony is interesting because it's whether I live or die, I'm going to follow God. Whether I face persecution or acceptance, I'm going to follow God. You and I, in the face of what we struggle today, whether it's, it's, it's 
subtle, like we, like we talked about in that prayer meeting, or whether it's reading your face, we must stand for what is right. We must stand for God. We must stand for the one who saved us. We must stand for the one who's changed our lives and gave us a new hope, who's given us peace, who's given us abundant life. We must stand for what is right in this world that wants to proclaim what is so wrong. You see, and often when we, when we stand up for what is right, when we stand up for God, we're not necessarily going to be politically correct. We're not going to be in a, accepted by what society is, 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 is acceptable today. Because when we say that there is only one way, when we say that there is only one truth, and that truth is Jesus Christ, the world says, sure, there can't just be one way or one truth. It's one possible way, one possible truth. And, we, and, and the reality is we as believers in Jesus Christ must need to stand up for what is right in, this, in these situations. Regardless of what we might face. These three young men were, were, knew that the punishment for not believing and not bowing down to this golden idol was something that was horrible. That they'd be thrown into the furnace. Now what is the furnace? Now when I think of a furnace, when I was heard this story, I can only get the picture of what I had down in the basement of our of our house, you know, the furnace that heated our home. And that didn't seem all that bad. It had a little pile of light and some burners on it. And it couldn't have been too bad. I mean, it wouldn't be, kind of be uncomfortable to go sit in it and be on it or, or whatever. It might even get burnt a little bit. But in my mind, that's what I, you know, as a child, that's what I pictured. But the furnace they're talking about is basically a fiery pit that was stoked so it was hot and would burn uh, burn the flesh right off you. It would just, you die. So they understood what they were about to face. So they were willing to stand up for what is right. They were willing to stand up, stand in the face of wrong. And they were willing to stand up for what they believed. And then we see standing up uh, when things don't look good in verse 19 through 23. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage. And the expression on his face changed toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times more than was customary. Now, I don't know what seven times hotter would be, but it doesn't sound really good, does it? I mean, if it's going to, you know, if you get a fire going hotter and hotter, it's not a great thing. So seven times, I don't know how they, they were able to, this just to, to get, express how hot it was going to be. And he commanded that some of the strongest soldiers in the army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the furnace uh, a blazing fire. And then going on, it says, So these men, in their trousers, robes, head coverings, and other clothes, were tied and thrown into the furnace of, of blazing fire. Now, why do they tell us what they're wearing? I think it's important, as we see later on, what happens to them, that it's important that, they, that when they see that they are fully clothed and they had everything on them and, uh, and so forth. And then going down, in verse 22, since the king commanded, man was so urgent, the furnace uh, and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who, who, who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the furnace of blazing fire. What a horrible, horrible situation we see. So in other words, when they stood up for their faith, when they, when they stood against what was wrong, they faced a horrible, horrible end of the flight, didn't they? In fact, the fire was so hot that when the men that were carrying them actually died as well. So I don't know if you've ever been next to a really hot fire, but I, you know, when I think about this, I, I think of the time when I used to work molding plastic for a little while. And we just all we wore was just simple leather gloves. And, I, and I, it, you just come away in your hand. Actually, after a while, you, you lost the sensation in your hand for the heat, of, heat for a long time. And, I, and even today, I, I don't really feel the heat, but that's how hot it was. And I, so when I imagine that hot, that heat, and then, but then I think about how that uh, these, these other men that were carrying them in were just died even coming close to it. We know that this fire was horrible. So they stood up for what is right. They stood in the face of wrong. They stood up for what they believed. And they were willing to stand when it didn't look too good, did it? They were willing to go and do whatever was necessary in order to continue to stay within their faith, to follow God, whatever they might face. How many of us are willing to do such a thing? How far?
far would you go in order to believe, or to, to, to stay committed to your God? Sometimes I think it's good for us to consider this and to look at this. But you know, you need to understand that, that what we're going to see in the next couple of verses is that God just doesn't leave you there. Look at verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He said to his advisors, didn't we, did we throw, didn't we throw these three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty. They, they replied to the king. He exclaimed, look, I see four, not, four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of gods, of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace of the blaze and fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and when they the satraps, prefects, and governors, and the king's advisors gathered around. They saw the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair on their head was singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. Have you ever been around a campfire? You know, I mean, you can't help but smell a campfire. You always, when you go out camping, um, you, you come home, you smell like a campfire. You, and you haven't even been into the, inside the fire. You know, I, last weekend I smoked some ham, not ham, what was it? Salmon, right, or no? And uh, I wasn't standing in the smoke or anything. I tried to keep, I tried to keep out of the smoke. But Ardell said, like, come on, every, after I do this, I come away and I smell like smoke. So these three men come out of the fire, and they don't even smell like smoke. And there's not a hair on their head that's been singed, and their clothes are all just fine. What else did you notice in this story? go up in the few chapters, the verses there, around verse 25, and we notice there wasn't just three men. Now, you remember the guys, the other three guys, I'm guessing three guys who tied them up had died, right? So, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are the only ones that went into the fire. But there's four. Now, some people would call this a Christophany. Now, what does that mean? It means an appearance of God in the Old Testament. Our appearance of Christ in the Old Testament. So this might be, this what I would guess is an appearance of Christ. That's what I would believe here is happening. So we see Jesus actually in the fire with these four men. What do we learn from this? We learn that even in the midst of struggles, even in the midst of facing the fire of, of this world, in the midst of uh, facing the struggles that, we are, that are hurled at us because of our faith, that we don't face it alone. That our Savior, our Lord, is walking alongside us the whole way. And we don't need to struggle all by ourselves. In the midst of this fire, in the heat of the, of the burning, we see God walking alongside these three men. And even Nebuchadnezzar recognizes that this is not just anybody. Because this, in verse, 20, in verse 25, he says, And the fourth looks like the Son of the Gods. And go up even further, or down, uh, up further, it talks about how majestic he looks, how, and uh, how, um, how he glowed in, in a sense. He looked very different. So, isn't this a fantastic uh, aspect here? We, we're, we stand up for what is right, we stand up in the face of wrong, we stand up for what we believe, and we stand when things don't look good, and when we're when standing in the strength, and when we do all this, we're standing in the strength protection of our Almighty God. When you face the struggle, when you face the battles of your life, you don't face it alone. But what did Jesus tell us? He said, I'm going to send you a comforter. I'm going to send you one that will walk beside you, indwell you, and, and, and give you the strength to face all that you must face. We don't face things alone. And look at all we continue on, we get to see in the last few verses what happens in the, in, in the lives of those around us when we, when we do stand up for what, is, what we believe. Nebuchadnezzar explains, praise the, to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent his angel and rescued his servants and trusted, who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than to serve and worship any god except their god. Therefore, I issue a decree that anyone, anyone, of any, of any people, nation, or language who 
says anything offensive against God, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn from limb to limb, and, and his horse made a, a, a garbage dump. Or pardon me, his whole horse. His house made a garbage dump. Didn't make sense to me either when I read it. But his house made a garbage dump. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. Then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now will you be rewarded by those around you? Possibly. But I would think what we notice here is that when we stand up for what is right, those around us realize that there's something different about the God that we serve. There's something different about the God that you serve, unlike any other God around you, of the peoples around us. He's there for us whenever we struggle. He's there for us whenever we face battles. God is in need of men and women who are willing to work through Him, to allow Him to work through them. Men and women who are not afraid of what the world might do for, to them. Men and women who are willing to live so that the world can see who their God is. What should I ask you? Are you one of those men or women? 2 Chronicles chapter 16, verse 9 says, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth, to show himself strong for those whose hearts are completely his. The Lord is searching for those who will be completely his. Isaiah chapter 41 verse 10 says, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be afraid, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold on to you with my righteous right hand. God will take care of you. God will hold on to you. He'll, if you'll, if he'll be there. And if, so we don't need to be afraid of what is around us. Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 23 through 26. Listen to what Jesus said to us. If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. What does a man benefit if he gains the whole world yet loses, loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes into his glory, and the and that of the Father and the holy angels. You see, Jesus wanted us to realize that He wants us to follow Him. He wants us to to uh, be His faithful uh, servants. He wants us to be His disciples. He wants us to be willing to follow no matter what we. Because he promises, I'll be there with you. I'm not, he promises that he'll send that comforter to be with us. In Hebrews 13, uh, chapter, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 1 through 6, it says, Let brotherly love continue. Don't neglect to show hospitality, for by doing so, some have welcomed angels as guests without knowing it. Remember the prisoner as though you were in prison with them, and the mistreated as though you yourself were suffering bodily. Marriage must be respected by all. Marriage, the marriage bed kept undefiled because God will judge immoral people and adulterers. Your life should be free from the love of money. Be satisfied with what you have. For himself, he, for, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Do you understand? Do you hear that? You don't need to worry about all these other things. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we, we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? You see, they can, they can do damage to this body. They can make me make fun of me. They can scoff at me. They can do all kinds of things to me. When my God is my God, when my God is my focus, I don't need to fear any of those things. Because He promises to be with me. I will be with you, nor I'll, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. You know, your family may make fun of you. Your family may not even want you to be a, a Christian. Your family may not even uh, um, uh, want you to do to follow Christ. Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And when we become a believer in Jesus Christ, what do we become? A child of the King. Our Father, our Heavenly Father, promises to walk with us every step of the way. Don't let this world determine what you believe. Stand up for what you believe. Stand
stand up for what is right. Stand in the face of wrong. Stand up for what you believe. Stand when, when things don't look good. Stand in the strength and protection of God. And the results you'll see in your life will be amazing.